My name is Sudaranthi Halali Pabhan. Again, I am the new electrophysiologist uh, to the group, referred to as a complex ablationist. Um, that's not a personality problem, it's actually a job description. <laughs> I'm here to kind of give you a practical uh, look at uh, you know, evaluating, using ambulatory monitoring, uh, and uh, sort of gauging your sense of when to get, uh, or when to send your patients for referrals. So we'll get started. Uh, traditionally, um, ambulatory monitoring has actually been used for uh, patients with syncope and palpitations, less frequently with patients who have ventricular ectopy or are at risk for sudden cardiac death. Uh, it can also be used for episodic shortness of breath, chest pain, or fatigue when it's not otherwise explained. And there's been increasing use of outpatient ambulatory monitoring, not only in the detection of, but also in the treatment of atrial fibrillation. And these, to give you an idea of how long-standing these are, these are the guidelines from uh, actually the turn of the century, 1999. They haven't changed much. Well, that's the wrong direction. Okay. All right, so this is my favorite picture out of the entire presentation. This is actually the original Holter monitor back in 1940. Uh, it's a 75-pound backpack with a reel-to-reel -reel FM tape analog interface uh, that actually has very large batteries. Uh, all of that can give you a couple hours of recording of a single lead outside of the hospital. You're also the coolest kid on the block if you had one of those. <laughs> and uh, obviously, we've come a long way from that. Uh, modern halter monitors are much smaller. The typical formulation uses anywhere from about two to three uh, electrodes that are worn continuously from a 24-hour to 48-hour period, and, and this catalogs every single heartbeat uh, that the patient might have during that time period. It also gives you a range uh, and can provide you with a range of heart rates um, over that, the course of that time and also quantify the amount of ectopy that a patient may be having. What's neat about the technology is that it doesn't require a patient to do anything outside of, you know, wearing the actual device itself for the time period that's allowed. Unfortunately, it's not real time. This information has to then be processed after the patient hands it in and then read by a physician. And that's important for, uh, as we will discuss later on. Event monitors or looping event recorders, as they're called, are smaller than halter monitors. Um, they actually continuously record information and when either a patient experiences a symptom or it meets or, or an arrhythmia, uh, occurs that uh, hits a pre-specified uh, criteria, uh, the device will record anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds worth of data. This is neat, it can provide you with almost real-time data uh, with uh, patients. Um, and that's uh, the way in, way in which that occurs is either through a trans-telephonic mechanism or now more commonly through a cellular mechanism. Um, and those are various modes. Uh, these guys are kind of neat, if you don't know about them. Um, implantable loop recorders have actually been around for some time now. If you look on the picture to the left with the hand, you can see the, the latest generation actually is a, a very, very, very small device. There's one from Medtronic and one from St. Jude. Uh, these devices are actually subcutaneously implanted. They give you a single lead EKG via two electrodes. Um, they're leadless, of course. And the neat thing about them is that they actually give you anywhere from two to three years worth of information, because that's how long they last. And they're fairly easy to explant. Um, this can actually be done uh, fairly easy within about five minutes of implantation. Um, MCOP monitors, or mobile cardiac telemetry units, uh, are similar. In my mind, I see them as, a, the, as, as monitors that actually have the, the best benefits of, of both a halter monitor and a looping uh, event recorder in that um, you can record, it's, first of all, it's a very small device. Secondly, you can record every single heartbeat that the patient has for the time duration, and that can last up to, or that can be accessible up to uh, 30 days. Um, but it also provides you with a real-time continuous monitoring system and two-way communication such that if your patient ran into trouble, you can actually communicate with the device to see if they were you know, either in the arrhythmia, out of the arrhythmia, alive or dead, that sort of stuff. Uh, they're very expensive, so uh, they are kind of hard to come by, and uh, technically they're, they're mostly being used for atrial fibrillation at this point. So that's great. You, you told me about uh, a few monitors. How do I use them? Well, in choosing what monitor, to, what monitor to use, the most important criteria are obviously the presenting symptoms, the frequency of symptoms, and of course the degree in which you think um, that there may be a life-threatening event uh, that occurs. So how do I do this? Well. For me, the first thing I think of is, um, is 48 hours a sufficient period of monitoring? Uh, and or am I interested mostly in heart rate trends 
or the quantification of ectopy or PACs or PVCs? Are those the most important aspects? And if that's the case, then a Holter monitor is exactly what you're looking for. If, as is with most patients, um, the symptoms can be much more sporadic. And in those instances, we tend to require a longer monitoring period. And of course, in those circumstances, you can either choose between either an event monitor or an implantable loop recorder. Now, an event monitor would suffice for less than 30 days, an ILR for less frequent symptoms. Um, we talked briefly about an MCOT monitor. Uh, again, if it, it, its application is important when in potentially in patients who have atrial fibrillation where we can actually quantify the arrhythmia burden, or in my mind, we've actually utilized it in patients who have uh, a suspicion of high degree block where we want instant real-time data. Uh, lastly, and this is kind of important, I want to just impart this upon you, but uh, there are evolving um, indications now to utilize uh, implantable loop recorders in patients that have actually had cryptogenic strokes. Um, there's actually a few studies that I've listed here that have uh, increased the detection rate post a cryptogenic stroke um, to detect uh, what you would refer to as asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, thus providing vital therapy to those patients. Um, okay, great. So when should I be concerned? Well, this is probably one of the most common findings that you'll come across. Everyone is familiar with atrial fibrillation. It's an irregular tachycardia without any significant organized uh, atrial activity or P waves. Um, well, what the, in one of the most common questions that I ask, or that I'm asked actually about atrial fibrillation is, um, how much is too much? And when do I start anticoagulating people? And I think it's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't think we really have the answer. Uh, we don't exactly know where to draw that line in the sand, to be perfectly honest, as electrophysiologists. But what we do know is that with as little as, and this study was really done in patients, with patients who had indwelling monitors, mostly pacemakers for sinus syndrome, with as little as six minutes of sustained atrial fibrillation, there was a two and a half fold increase in the stroke risk. So just to impart that upon you. Um, treatment wise, well, to go back, you know, 90%, it's up to 90% of patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation uh, have triggers that start from the pulmonary veins. And that is the cornerstone of uh, the uh, pulmonary vein isolation procedure. Um, later on, when patients, as you can see with the graph on the left-hand side, when the burden increases or time increases in atrial fibrillation, the AFib is kind of like an in-law that just wanna sticks around, it shifts things around in your house, makes a home, and then it just doesn't wanna leave at all, to be perfectly honest. I'm not bitter about anything at all, don't worry. But, <laughs> so um, it, it tends to stick around, and it becomes much more challenging to get rid of because the substrates migrate in most people from the veins out into the rest of the heart. Uh, and so, um, we know from you know, almost 20 plus years of experience that there's no mortality benefit in treating atrial fibrillation, or restoring rhythm, rather. Uh, but we do know in symptomatic patients uh, that there would be a significant benefit associated with the rhythm control. Most common symptoms, usually fatigue and exercise intolerance, as I mentioned over here. I do want to impress upon you the importance of early um, referral for rhythm restoration if that is the strategy that you choose for this reason. If you take PBI, for example, the success rate of a single, PV, of a single procedure at one year with an antiarrhythmic therapy in a patient who has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, meaning it comes mostly from the veins, is much higher than later on when they have persistent atrial fibrillation when the substrate exists throughout the rest of the atrium. And I think that's an important uh, differentiation. Um, I also want to, you know, and this was recently highlighted by the 2014 uh, guidelines for atrial fibrillation, but I think it's also important to send very symptomatic patients, but, but also, you know, consider sending it for even minimally symptomatic patients that are young, less than the age of uh, 50, and certainly in patients who you suspect have had a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy where uh, that may be reversible with rhythm restoration. Okay, moving on. So um, the cousin of atrial fibrillation, uh, atrial flutter, awfully familiar to everybody here. We had a sawtooth pattern. It's treated a lot like atrial fibrillation, anticoagulated like atrial fibrillation. Um, as an electrophysiologist, I'd like to say that I have a bias when I tell people to refer them to procedures, but you can see here that with uh, atrial flutter in and of itself, uh, the procedure actually has a very high curative rate, about 95% actually at a 20 year interval as it was studied with a very low complication rate, and that's less than 1%. And if, um, if flutter exists alone without atrial fibrillation, which occurs about 50% of the time, some studies about 60% of the time, there's been a uh, appreciation or depreciation in the stroke risk as well too and the need for anticoagulation. 
So um, here's the quiz part of this. Um, the Scapo or Monica cannot answer. What is this rhythm? I'll give you one second, that's it. Uh, it's a narrow complex tachycardia. Almost everybody in the room would say SVT. If you guessed and said, oh, it's probably ABNRT, you would probably be correct because that is the most common arrhythmia in this category. Um, I look at this a little bit closely and I see a little premature atrial complex there, a long PR and then a retrograde P wave. Uh, a narrow complex tachycardia with a short RP interval that actually ends with a QRS, most likely uh, ABNRT in this group. Uh, and the reason I mention that is that your symptomatic patients that have ABNRT um, you know, can also be referred for uh, radiofrequency ablation. And oftentimes, that's, it sounds a bit scary, but I wanted to just share some data with you. This is probably the largest subset of patients that were retrospective effectively analyzed about 8,000 patients actually that underwent ablations at uh, various centers around the country. And you can see that the long-term success rate, this is specifically for AVNRT, uh, was about 99% repeat procedures, only in a 1 in 0.3% and a significant complications, of which included a pacemaker implant, um, occurred less than half a percentage rate. So, um, you know, these are, in the modern era, these are fairly safe procedures that can be done with a very high degree of success. Um, what do you do when you uh, see a wide complex tachycardia? Um, use the bathroom almost immediately. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I think patients uh, you know, who have uh, sustained or even non-sustained um, wide complex tachycardia should be referred uh, if they have a history of syncope, or paroxysmal dizziness, or, or a sudden cardiac arrest. I guess sudden cardiac death would prevent them from being referred, uh, <laughs> especially if they have structural heart disease. All right, so um, six sinus syndrome or heart block, um, you know, refer patients with symptomatic pauses greater than three seconds, asymptomatic greater than five seconds, and then referral for a high degree AV block or heart block. Um, it's important to say that that should also occur during waking hours. Um, PVCs, people often ask me, what about PVCs? Actually, I think four people here have asked me about PVCs today. Um, well, for the most part, they're benign. We all have them. Um, every cell in the body has the ability to generate its own pacemaking or, or its own rhythm, really. Uh, but as with most things in life, everything in excess can be problematic. And PVCs, especially in excess, can certainly lead to cardiomyopathies, significant symptoms, which may include exercise intolerance, um, and obviously just symptoms in and of itself. Um, if they're unifocal, or even if they're clustered near each other, um, a radiofrequency ablation actually can be curative. Uh, and if uh, a large burden of PVCs are responsible for a cardiomyopathy, that number is varies depending on the study, but anywhere from 15,000 on up uh, can actually lead to a cardiomyopathy in certain individuals. Um, uh, radiofrequency ablation can actually cure that and reverse the cardiomyopathy if caught early. Um, and I just wanted to end with a case actually that we did. This is about seven months ago down in New Orleans. This is a gentleman who's 55 who was referred to us for an ICD implant with an LVEF of 25%. He had a cath that was negative, um, didn't have a family history of a cardiomyopathy in the past. We did notice that he had significant, a significant burden of uh, PVCs. Here you can see that he's in ventricular bigeminy in clinic. Um, so we took a look at these EKGs, and they look like they're uh, fairly commonly, uh, the, this morphology of EKG is, fairly com uh, com is the most common variant uh, of the idiopathic kind. Um, and you can see here if you're, uh, really enjoy reading uh, PVC morphologies like I do. It's a left bundle, left inferior access, uh, and an early V2 transition that kind of puts it in the aortic cusp region. And there's actually a little notching phenomenon right here in V1 that is sometimes associated with um, its lo uh, location between the, the aortic cusps themselves. This has been established by the Penn Group in the past. So we took this uh, gentleman actually to the lab uh, the top right picture is actually uh, from the case, and the other two are barred from a similar uh, published talk. But uh, we found the location of these PVCs and isolated it to, by activation actually between the right and left uh, commissure of the cusps, and we were actually able to eradicate it with at least, f looks like, eight applications of radiofrequency energy over there. Um, and in, he actually went from a PVC burden of 22,000 PVCs in a given 24-hour period to less than 3,000. Uh, his cardiomyopathy reversed, and he was very happy. We did not put an ICD in this gentleman. So I just want to, you know, not every case goes like this, but it's incredibly gratifying when it does. 
Um, well, that's all I have. Uh, again, uh, my name is kind of challenging, but it's uh, go by Dr. T or Dr. Suderon. As long as you don't call me Mr. T, we're good. <laughs>